Okay, we'll get started in a, just a few minutes here. All righty, so let's get started here. Um, hi, and welcome to the AIDS Lifecycle 2020 workshop. I am Celia, and I also go by Seal, and I am a cycle rep here at the SoCal uh, office for the Los Angeles LGBT Center, and uh, my position is to steward all of the out-of-state cyclists. So it's pretty unique, and I get to do a lot of traveling and also cater to the out-of-state needs. Um, I am a one-time uh, roadie for the AIDS Life Cycle, and this is my second month on staff, so very new. Um, but I have a lot of experience with cross country cycling and working in the nonprofit world, and it has been wonderful so far. Um, also, here with me this evening is Aurelia, and she'll be answering questions, and I'll throw it over to her for a second to introduce herself. Perfect. Thanks, Aurelia. Um, so first, I wanted to take a moment to welcome you and to thank you and congratulate you for registering for the 2020 ride. We're very excited to have you. Um, you're embarking on a, a life-changing journey and making a massive impact in the fight against HIV and AIDS and joining the most wonderful community of people that you can imagine. So it took a lot of courage to commit to riding 545 miles and raising $3,000. So congratulations. You're already a hero. 
So, all right, fundraising and getting started. So these are the main topics that we're going to cover in this workshop um, with plenty of room for Q&A. Um, over on the side of your webinar panel, there should be a spot for questions. That's where Aurelia will be able to answer those in real time. Um, so, a little disclaimer though, there is another workshop on the calendar called Life on the Ride, and that one is a little bit more specific to about logistics, bike shipping, tenting, rest stops, and the menu, and all things week of event. Um, so you're, if you have any questions about that specifically, your cycle rep is happy to answer those for you, but this is a, a different workshop for that. So we're going to focus more on the nuts and bolts of what you need to do to get started, get the ball rolling, and so forth. So here we go. So the mission of AIDS life cycle and what are the goals? Um, let's jump in and answer the first question of the night. So why are we here? Um, and where does this money go? So within the two, there are, are two organizations, the Los Angeles LGBT Center and the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And AIDS life cycle is an event that's co-produced by these two uh, organizations. So over the course of a week, over 2,300 riders and more than 650 volunteers ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles for a total of 545 miles. This event helps provide funds for critical HIV AIDS programs and services and has raised over $16.7 million in 2019. Some of the goals of AIDS Lifecycle are to raise funds and support for HIV and AIDS services, increase awareness and knowledge about services and programs, increase awareness and knowledge about HIV and AIDS, um, increase AIDS activism and volunteerism, and provide a positive, life-affirming experience. So educate yourself about the San Francisco AIDS Foundation and the Los Angeles LGBT Center, um, the programs, the services they offer, so that you can speak to the impact made by each of your donations. Uh, when donors can really relate a dollar value to an action or a result, it offers them much more of a sense of participation and value. Um, check the resources page of our website um, for there's uh, mission squares. You can study up on the center and foundation on um, both of their websites. That's a great place to learn more. Um, talk to your cycle rep and learn about how important your donations are. Also in this webinar, we have attached uh, handouts, which you can also access on the right side. And there's one about where does your money go? And it kind of breaks it down between the two. Um, that's a great re resource, especially I like to use them when making social media posts. Um, so for those living in SoCal, the money will raise will go to the center. Um, and the people who are living in NorCal, their donations go to the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. And then for any uh, out-of-state and international riders and uh, roadies, those funds are split evenly between both organizations. Um, so there are a couple of examples of things that money goes towards in LA. It's HIV and STD screening, vaccinations, access to PrEP and PEP, including rapid start HIV care, um, linkage to care and case management support and support groups. Um, up in SF, they do a bunch of work with HIV, Hep C, and STI testing, linkage to treatment, access to PrEP and PEP again, housing and financial aid for people living with HIV, and more support groups as well. Um, so there's a term that we use a lot in AIDS life cycle called the love bubble, um, and we use it to describe the community on the ride, but it is also present year-round. So the name was given due to an overwhelming amount of support love and encouragement that you'll find during the ride. Um, and we truly hope that you get to experience this feeling throughout the year and on the actual ride itself. Our community is composed of people from all over the planet and from all different backgrounds, ethnicities, and genders, which makes for a beautiful melting pot of humans on the event. Um, so up next, cycling basics. Um, now that we kind of know what eighth life cycle is, where the money goes, um, getting a bike. So what bike should you use um, for that? We really have um, so many different options. If you're not a cyclist yet and you're looking to get a bike, um, awesome. We want to support you in everything that we can, but reach out to your cycle rep first. Um, before you jump into any purchases, you might want to ask yourself some questions like, what is your budget for your bike and your gear? Um, and also, are you planning on using this bike to also commute? Are you going to keep riding after the ride? 
Um, so there are lots of different types of bikes as well. And um, this part more depends on your budget, your preference, and if you intend to use the bike after the event a lot or just kind of casually. Um, so the three main types of material used for bikes are carbon fiber, which is light and strong and absorbs a little bit of the rattle while you're on the road. Alloy, which is heavier than carbon fiber, super strong. It does not absorb the impact quite as well as the carbon fiber. And then there's steel, so very heavy, very strong, absorbs a lot of impacts as well. Um, but again, very heavy. Um, so there are a bunch of people use road bikes on the event. Some people use fixies, so one gear in the front and one gear in the back, and they ride that, which is incredible. Um, mountain bikes, recumbents, hybrids. Um, if it's got wheels and it rides, um, we'll take it. Um, you will discover kind of during your training rides, um, and do a little bit of research online and on the event. There are many different types of bikes. So whether you're looking to purchase new or used bike, we recommend that you just try it out first and see how it feels. Um, keep in mind that this is an endurance event and you will want to be comfortable and sit on your saddle for hours at a time. Um, when also looking for uh, bikes, we would like to ski, uh, steer you towards our community partners. So you don't have to break the bank to find a bike. Um, we have community partners first, so reach out to one of them. You to contact your cycle rep. We can help you find them um, to ask all of your bike questions and get a discount. And we have those listed on the AIDS Lifecycle website as well under, if you put in the search bar, uh, CP and also community partners. There's a drop-down menu. Um, asking around. So borrowing a bike from a friend can always be an option. Uh, let your network know through Facebook or contacting them directly that you're looking to borrow a bike for the season. And then um, if you don't have a friend who has a bike, you can try the Facebook Marketplace um, or Craigslist. Shopping online can be very successful if you have a little bit of patience. Um, there are some hidden gems waiting out there, and you just have to be kind of picky. Um, and then Bicycle Angels. So that is a, something that we offer down here in SoCal. Um, they are a nonprofit that... Um, borrows bikes to folks for the duration of your training and through the ride. So um, to locate the one that's closest to you, contact your cycle rep and they can get you going on that as well. Um, in terms of being on your bike, you're going to be on it for hours at a time. So uh, this is an endurance event and you might consider getting a bike fitting, um, which is the, you go into a shop and they try and achieve the most comfortable, efficient, powerful, and safe riding position for you um, as well. So the main bottom line here is that if you don't have a bike yet, there are a couple different options, and we don't want anyone to have to break the bank to do AIDS life cycle. Um, we have options, and we are here to support you um, as much as we can in that. So... Um, cycling gear. Um, in gear, AIDS life cycle being an endurance event, you want a bike that you're comfortable on. And this also applies to your gear. So riding many miles can be an exhausting endeavor um, for your behind and you must also protect it. Um, wearing padded shorts is my highest recommendation and that's what will ease the press pressure that you put on your behind for several hours at a time. Um, try out different brands and see the ones that fit you best. Um, padding varies um, on thickness, material, size, etc. So there are a bunch of different things to look at. Um, in terms of what we require for AIDS Life Cycle, you must have a helmet. Um, your helmet should fit you properly and be well adjusted to your head. Um, in the cycling world, we like to see helmets um, more forward, um, no more than two fingers over the eyebrow and one finger underneath. It's like a good um, sizing reference. Um, sunglasses, we recommend a pair of polarized sunglasses that kind of wraps around your eyes um, to kind of protect from that side sun and also the wind uh, because you will be outside for many hours at a time. Jerseys, although not required, are certainly nice. Um, they are recommended. They have a couple different features, so they're very light, breathable, fast to dry. They also have pockets in the back, which are super handy. Um, and then shorts and bibs. So I like to wear bibs over shorts. I think they're a little bit more smooth. It kind of reduces chafing around my middle, um, but that's totally a perf or personal preference. Um, and there are 
um, there are different brands, so kind of shop around for that. And um, the bib goes up over your shoulders, and then uh, there's no waistband or drawstring, which I think is nice. Um, and then lastly, arm and leg warmers. So it tends to be a bit chilly in the mornings of the ride. Um, and to combat this, we add to your gear kit a pair of arm and leg warmers. They keep you warm, um, and they protect you from the sun during the day. And the nice thing about them is that you can easily roll them down and then put them in your back pocket. So they're significantly smaller than a jacket, which is really great. Um, oh, and then next, a windbreaker. So as you're sweating, your jersey really wicks super nice. But when the wind comes by and it hits the sweat, it can make you very cold very fast. Um, so a windproof cycling jacket will stop the wind in its tracks, and it will keep you from feeling the wind chill. And then lastly, socks and shoes. So most summer cycling socks are made from polyester because it's breathable and it can be woven into thin fabrics and it wicks sweat away from the skin. Um, polyester fabrics also dry quickly, which helps your feet stay dry. Um, and then cycling socks also have a cuff, which prevents the sliding, um, the sock from sliding down your ankle. Um, more specifically on shoes. Um, you can use any shoes that you really want during the ride. Um, there are a couple different options um, from the cycling world, so clipless or clip-on shoes. Uh, most people on the ride will use clip-on shoes, so clipping in where your foot connects to your pedal and then you twist your ankle to get out. It's a little bit terrifying to start, so we always uh, recommend asking for advice from a professional at a bike shop and then practicing over grass if you're afraid to fall. Um, when I was learning, I went, I sat on my bike in my house in between, in the hallway and put my hands on both of the walls. So it wasn't a very far way to fall and just practice clipping in and out with my shoes. Um, the benefits of using the clip on shoes are really big for your performance because you're able to not only push on the pedals, but you can also pull up, um, which makes a big difference when you're trying to go up a hill. Um, it also engages different muscles and it spreads the effort across your legs. Um, so it's something to consider. But you can do the ride without clip-on shoes, um, just using toe cages or nothing at all. It's really up to you. Um, another recommendation that we do is mountain biking shoes with the recessed cleat. So if you see here in the picture, Steve and Tim, they have their shoe, and then this is called an SBD clip. And when they walk on the ground, you the clip is not on the ground. So it's much easier since we do a lot of walking. Um, it kind of protects the cleats so it won't wear as fast, and it also gives you a little bit more terrain. There are other cycling shoes that are hard right on the bottom here, and then they have a another cleat here on the bottom. Just two different types of shoes, completely up to you. They both work. They do the same job. Um, just a nice feature of this is when you get off, if you're at the artichoke stop, uh, it's easier to walk, and it doesn't wear down your cleats as fast. So in terms of training, uh, 545 miles in seven days kind of says it all. It's important to train for this, um, not only to avoid injuries, but to be able to enjoy the entire ride. Um, so as this year progresses, training rides will be available to you to join through our calendar. Um, and they are usually hosted by different teams or riding groups and will be managed by training ride leaders, um, whose role is to educate riders and make sure everyone is riding in a safe environment. Um, to view the available training rides, if you go onto AIDS Lifecycle and you click on Calendar and News, and you can filter those by event category and rides. Um, whether you're part of a team or not, going onto an AIDS Lifecycle training ride is a great way to meet other riders, um, being able to kind of gauge yourself where you're at, um, being able to ask recommendations and questions to the training ride leaders, and also discovering new rides that are happening around you. Um, so people are more likely to enjoy the ride if they participate in some kind of training um, we have found time after time. Um, that leads us into teams. So um, there are a couple key points about teams. Um, one, it's a fact. Those people on teams raise more than those who are not on teams. So in terms of uh, raising money to end AIDS, we encourage everyone to be on a team. Um, and although being on a team is not required, it is a great way to experience the ride. Um, so if you're ever looking or need help finding a team, talk to your cycle rep. We are here as a resource for you. Um, and we can kind of get you plugged in with a team that uh, fits your riding style, fits what's going on in your area, and what makes the most sense for you. Um, participants who are part of a team tend to have a much higher retention rate than those who are not. 
Um, team members are 74% more likely to return. And uh, being on a team does provide that extra added support um, that can make the difference when you're cycling down the coast. This is a hard work. Um, and the accountability of having a team is also something to think about. Helps motivate you to get out of bed, show up for a training ride. Um, and you have the opportunity to fundraise with your teammates um, to make it more fun, a bit less daunting as well. So, fundraising. What is peer-to-peer -peer fundraising? So, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is um, a model that we use in fundraising campaigns, which is what we use at AIDS Lifecycle. Um, it's important to understand what this is so you can approach your campaign effectively and be successful. This is actually very different from crowdfunding, um, which we are a little bit more accustomed to. So in crowdfunding, an agency or an individual throws an ask out to the universe and kind of hopes that the call is heard um, by people who want to support them. We saw this kind of in the I Stand for, with Planned Parenthood campaign. Um, it's also the backbone of Kickstarter. Versus peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is a little bit more personal. So this model leverages our existing networks to make some really genuine connections. It gives your network the opportunity to support you and the work of the benefit organizing or the benefiting organizations. So this strategy leverages those relationships that you already have. You're not going halfway around the world and back to tug on the heartstrings of some strangers. Um, you're just talking to people that you know. This means you can make more informed asks that fit the specific situations of each one of your potential donors. Your donors already know you and they want to support you. And people are partially donating just because they love you. And seriously, take that to heart. Um, a lot of the donation is because they care about you, they're invested in you, your story, and why you ride. So since you're already talking to people that you already know, you can use your own story. Um, this is really important when making the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising method work. Um, we as agencies can throw out facts and figures and statistics, um, but at the end of the day, when you tell your story about why you're doing this event, uh, people will be much more interested. We all love to look into someone else's life, and this motivates us to support their cause. Um, once you have shared your story with your network, these folks may be willing to share it with their networks, and this is also an important strategy in, in increasing and growing your fundraising potential. Um, finally, do-gooding is contagious. When people see others getting involved, being awesome, they are compelled to be awesome too. Um, because your neighbor donated, why the heck has your mom donated yet? Um, you're doing something amazing, and the impact that you're making in the fight against HIV is immense, and others will want to join you in the fight. Besides that, you've committed to ride over 500 miles, and will, and some will support you just for that fact alone. So, getting started. It's crafting your ask. So, to be eligible to participate in the AIDS life cycle, each rider is required to raise a minimum of $3,000. However, the average fundraising sits at about $6,000. Um, so the higher your goal is, the faster it will be for you to reach the minimum. We therefore recommend that you set a goal of at least $5,000. And many of you should just try and bump it up to $10,000. Uh, that might seem like a lot. And hopefully by the end of this, you feel a little bit more confident to reach for those high fundraising goals. Um, but we want you to know that fundraising doesn't have to be intimidating, and we have created a lot of help along the way to help you succeed. Um, so getting started in asking yourself these three questions for fundraising. Why do you write? What's your connection? You don't have to know someone who has HIV or AIDS to be connected. What's your story? We all have one, and don't underestimate the power of yours. And then who is your audience? So if you take a piece of paper and you start writing down your network into categories, like I have my close family, my best friends, my gym friends, my close colleagues, my previous bosses, and my current one, my best friends' families, etc. cetera. Um, and we have a worksheet called the Fast 40, which you can also find over on the right side of your screen as well. And that is a great way to like write down different people in your network. Um, so an example of my story would be um, I was really passionate about HIV and AIDS. I came from a very conservative community. I didn't really know much about uh, HIV or AIDS until I went to college. And then I was like, oh, this is really a big epidemic. Um, so in my story, 
I found the ride because I love cycling. I came out of the womb on a bike and I wanted to combine uh, my love of cycling with my passion for nonprofit work, for um, health justice and for HIV and AIDS, which I had learned more and more about. Um, So my theme was about getting me to the finish line. So each donation, I treated it like it was um, fuel towards me getting to the finish line. Um, I also tried to think of it as every donation that I raised as reason to go that next mile. So um, people making donations was like cheerleading me on, making the most encouragement. Um, And so in my story, I was the character. I was biking down the coast of California. The villain was HIV and AIDS. I wanted to um, improve health justice and access to health care for people living with HIV and AIDS, the villain. Um, and the hero in my story is the donor. So the person who's moving me closer to getting down the coast and raising money for um, health um, care for people that I care about. So crafting your own story Um, all comes down to you and never negate anything that's happened um, to be honest and um, people, people will listen. So who to ask? Um, We have uploaded um, this document for you, the fast 40, which I just mentioned um, as an exercise to be super fun and helpful. Um, So there's 10 categories of people that live in your life. And then Um, people that you don't necessarily interact with so much, people that you really highly interact with, um, businesses that you shop at, like your hairdresser, your tattoo artist, your favorite farmer's market vendor. Um, And then when you think about these groups, you want to identify four people from each that we might feel comfortable pitching our ask to. So obviously it's going to be a bit easier to think of my family members than it will be to dredge up someone from high school, but you don't necessarily have to have a deep relationship with someone to ask them to support a great cause. Um, We're really just trying to identify people who we might actually know and recognize us as part of their community. And notice that I said I might feel comfortable with. Um, We also might have to go outside our comfort zone, but it'll be totally worth it. And really give this an honest effort. Um, identifying those some of the uh, out and left field people can really be when your inner networks start to grow from within. Um, if you think about it this way, you can also ask 40 people, and if each of your 40 people donated $100 or $10 a month for 10 months, then that's $4,000. How awesome would it feel to get this over with and grab that ticket to ride and um, fundraise all this money for HIV and AIDS? So it just takes a little initiative and um, to identify and then to ask. So writing down the names of people in your social network can be extra helpful to plan and organize your fundraising campaign. Um, also don't hesitate to ask your uh, your cycle rep. We are here to help you fundraise and in, in um, brainstorming who might be in your circles to contact. So your participant center. When you registered, you should have received an email to create your participant center. So this will be your profile. It's where you tell your story um, and where people will go to donate. So let's have a quick overview on how to access it and the tools available for you to go there. So if I go to the Googles um, and I type in the AIDS Lifecycle website and I go up on the top here to log in, I've already pulled it up. It pulls me into my participant center. So in here, um, once you've logged in, this is where you'll see track your fundraising progress. It also tells you how many days are left. Um, And down here, we'll keep a running tab of different things that are on your to-do list. Um, As you get closer to the ride, that will become more and more important. Um, So a couple things I like to point out. First, up at the top here to your uh, personal page. In this gray box, you can change your URL your URL to be custom. So um, my friends and family know me as SEAL, so I've changed my URL to be www.fighthiv.org slash go to SEAL. And so that is the URL that I send to all of my fans um, when I ask them to donate. Um, and then in here, I wrote a little bio, or a little um, bio. I love AIDS Life Cycle. This is what I'm doing. Thanks for joining me. Safe. 
Um, if you go back to the home page and you click on down here in fundraising tools, view your personal page, that's what it's going to look like when someone's directed to your page to make a donation. So they can go donate here. Um, you can have a fundraising honor roll. So let's get back out of here. Um, in my personal page, there are different components. So if I want to see all my donors to be listed on a scroll, you can do that. Um, there's a status thermometer, so how much I've raised. You can. It's a fun way to keep track. Um, also in your participant center is um, emails that we have prefabbed for you. So if you go in email, compose, um, we have several different options. So a thank you note, I want to thank you to my people. Thank you. Next, um, I want this header and um, I can create an email in here. We also have, oops, it's a data error. Um, let's go back. And anyways, in here we have some emails that will um, be pre-populated that you can just send out to your participants. And so in here, it will list all my donors' names if I'm sending them a thank you. And then I hit next and save, and I'm able to send emails to all of my donors right from the website, which is a nice feature. Um, also in here, progress, nice stuff for you here. Um, also on the home page, some other things to point out. Um, in your fundraising tools here, um, there's the social media assets, which are little blurbs that are really great for posting to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, viewing your personal page, and a matching gifts tool that we'll talk about in a little bit. So back to the PowerPoint. All right, so personal page. Participant center, we've set up couple other tools um, for promoting. So you have your participant center. That's where people are going to go to donate. Um, but how do you ask them to donate? So there are a few key points to hit again. Um, asking is uncomfortable. Um, but you're not asking for handouts. It's an opportunity for someone to get involved in important work. Um, and not asking is actually rude. You're making the decision for them. And you never know who is affected or their capacity to give. So the average donation takes eight asks, and not because you wear them down, but because of the timing. Um, so catching people at the right time. Um, and then if you look at the different levels here, so direct ask, one-on-one, -on -one, real life. Um, so you've got their attention here, and now you can act. Um, it's harder to say no to your face. Um, and not in person, but still considered part of this would be phone calls, direct emails, um, text, Facebook Messenger, et cetera. Um, the next level of communication would be group communications. So in a larger group, it's a little bit closer to crowdfunding. Um, so when you ask people in a work meeting or in a group email, um, a big newsletter that you send out. Um, and then lastly, the passive ask. So social media, um, although very popular, it is not the most effective. Um, the donation ratio to pr is pretty low to people who actually see it to those who donate. Um, but we'll talk about strategies to make social media um, a little bit more effective in a few slides. Um, and then there's also the transaction, transactional ask. Um, so this would arguably be the most fun way to ask. Um, so doing events. So a beer bust. The bar is donating with space is part of your donor, or your donor network. Um, a raffle, if you gather prizes from your local community, like shops, hotels, massages, restaurants, um, you've leveraged your network to get those raffle items. Um, a bake sale, an art craft sale. Um, does anyone that you know have a, a, a craft or a trade, something that you can use to auction or raffle off. My one friend is really good at making furniture. Um, I have asked him before to make a piece of furniture that I sell off as, in a raffle um, to raise money off for the cost. Um, a bike or a car wash, a drag show, it's something we do here at AIDS Lifecycle. Um, attendees can vote via donations. So there's just a bunch of different ideas, lots of things that are going on, and your cycle rep can send you an email of a bunch of things that are happening right now. And please like share your ideas with us. We're always curious to hear what people are up to, what's working, and uh, so we can spread them among the community. So media assets, I, I pointed to in the uh, participant center. Um, if you also poke around in the resources tab on the AIDS Lifecycle website, you'll be able to see these shareable squares. 
um, and feel free to use them in your messages to people. Um, they are available to you um, and we we highly recommend. So breaking it down. Um, you want your donor to understand that their donation not only gets to you or gets you to your ultimate goal, which is down the coast of California, but it also does this much in this time. So ten dollars a month for ten months changes four lives for an entire year. So once again, if you educate yourself on the services and programs offered at the center and the foundation, it puts things in perspective for your donors. So the amount that you spend per month on your Starbucks is about $100. Um, this money it could actually change four lives for a full year. Um, so adding some perspective. Also, to start your fundraising now, um, as soon as it comes in, we're actively putting it into programs. Um, so the more you the sooner you can donate or to start working on it um, we're using it actively we don't just wait for the ride um, so that's an incentive as well for people to be donating always um, social media so big one for this is have fun but also you only have three seconds to um, get to your audience so capture their attention Tell them what you need and then show them your impact. So thinking like a mosquito, as we like to say around here. So you come in, you're buzzing, you sting, and then you leave. Um, so you're only there for a short amount of time. Um, on social media, so anytime you write a post or an email, start with something that grabs the reader's attention. Um, the best way to do this is to always include a photo, um, especially of your face or of doing something with your bike. Um, some of my best fundraising photos are me at the end of 100 miles looking destroyed. Um, people are excited to see that I'm doing something that's actionable, that I'm serious about the goal, um, and that I'm working on it already. Um, always include your URL. Um, remember that it can be customized um, to make it shorter. Um, also, something to note is if you put the URL in the comments, sometimes it is less likely by Facebook to be buried. Um, so that's something that we recommend as well. Um, and then just keep it brief and then make sure that it's public. So if it has the little world next to the name up there, that allows people to share your posts with their networks as well so everyone can see it. So it just kind of broadens your potential impact. Um, and then dedicating a day or goal. So in terms of perspective, Telling your potential donors that I need to raise $3,000 by May 31st can seem a little bit far in time um, and a lot of money all at once. It can be really overwhelming. So giving people a time frame and a smaller amount can make the task seem much more achievable. For example, this week, let's all raise $500 for AIDS life cycle and put me closer to my goal. Or today, I will ride 70 miles or until I get to raise $500 in one day. So please don't make me ride more miles and donate. Um, we have set up uh, different dates and swag, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to kind of help give you these dedicated goals to kind of work your way towards. We just had our $500 fundraising cap, um, and the next one will be our 1K jersey. So having fun. Um, dedicating a birthday, taking a thirst pick, um, this guy over here had his highest donor, got to have their face tattooed on his butt. Um, so just having fun, different ways to do. Uh, this person raffled off an iPad that she got. Um, this one also was a tattoo. Um, very, everyone loves tattoos, I guess. Um, but there's no right or wrong way to fundraise, and we want you to dig into your personal skills. So if you're a writer, a yoga teacher, good at drawing, you love to bake, um, use these personal skills and yours as trade-offs for donation. Uh, people will love to receive something for from you in return for their contributions. And you'll have more fun getting donations as they will as well. Um, it's a win-win situation. Uh, most importantly, say thank you. Um, thank every person that has supported you by sharing your story, and by riding with you, or by donating. Um, these people are part of your journey and would be even more thankful if in return you thank them and give them recognition for what they've done. And you never know, they might donate again. Also mention their name. So when you tag your friends on Facebook, then all of your mutual friends see that post too. So if your mutual friends see enough posts, then they're going to start thinking, well, shoot, I don't want to be the only person who is not donating to SEAL. 
and then write a thank you letter. Um, snail mail is not outdated, um, and it's a very nice touch. It's a little bit more personal. In terms of asking, um, never who assume who will and who won't. So it's not up to you to decide if someone will donate to your ride or not, and it's it's up to them. So by assuming, oh, my Aunt Martha will never donate, you're making the decision for her and limiting your fundraising. So don't be afraid to ask everyone and do not assume. Remember that you never know who can relate to your story and the impact it can have on people you know and strangers. Um, some of my most uh, meaningful donations have come from people who I really thought um, couldn't afford to spare anything, and they, they did and donated to me, and that was so meaningful to get everything that they have. Um, and it could come from everyone, so um, don't limit who you do and don't ask. Some other powerful fundraising tools, um, pledges. Um, so pledging a certain amount of money allows the person to give a big total donation um, that will be divided into smaller ones throughout a longer period of time. So for an example, I would like to donate $500 to your ride, but I'm a bit tight on the money. So on the eighthlifecycle.org website, I will be asked if I want to donate by spreading my donations on different months. So then I can donate $100 a month for five months. Um, the great thing about pledges is that the full amount will be reflected right away in your participant center, but the donor will only pay once a month for that period that they choose. So it allows people to donate more, and it's important to educate your potential donor on this as an option. Um, end of year tax deductions will run another workshop as the end of the year gets closer, but all of our donations are 100% tax deductible. So every time someone makes a donation, they will receive an email that will act as a receipt so that they can deduct it from their taxes. So small businesses and individuals like to look for organizations and events to donate to um, as a write-off. So important to mention to your donors as well. And then matching gifts. So a matching gift is a charitable donation by a corporation or business that matches an employee's donation for an, elig an eligible nonprofit organization. Um, usually it's one-to-one, -one, sometimes it's two-to-one, sometimes it's one-to-two. Um, so find out if your company or your um, friend's company might have a matching gift program. Um, ask your potential donors if their employers have a matching gift program. And then use the uh, matching gift donation. So if you go into your participant center, the new matching gifts tool, this is a great resource to find um, the companies. It doesn't have 100% uh, of them, so always double check. But um, a lot of them can be found here. It's a great resource. All right. So fundraising swag. I kind of touched on this earlier, the $500 cap. Um, we do fundraising throughout the year, and so we want you to be able to build this life, AIDS Lifecycle Cycling Kit. Um, so let your friends and family know that you're you're chasing after this, this goal. Uh, so the next goal will be the uh, $1,000 jersey, which is by November 22nd. Um, and we create these deadlines for you to post to your people, like, I got to get to 1K before November 22nd so I can earn this jersey. And then um, I like to send out thank yous of me in the jersey or the thing that I pushed for. Um, these dates will also keep you on track so that you're not um, scrambling for fundraising. It's at a very comfortable pace. Um, and it's milestones to help you to motivate your donors. And it's a cute kit. All right. So one last tip for the road, um, a keyboard text replacement. Um, so this is pretty new. Um, if you could create a shortcut to your URL. Um, so for example, if you are typing HIV or whatever you choose, um, it auto automatically expands into your URL. So um, if you go into your, if you have an iPhone, this works, a settings, general, keyboard, text replacement, plus to add a new shortcut, and then phrase your personal U or your URL. Um, it just makes it a lot easier when you're trying to share your URL to someone, especially in text messages. Um, yeah, it's a good resource. All right, so fundraising in summary. Um, the big picture is just think outside the box. Um, no idea is too small or too big. Um, keep your donors engaged and excited. So like we said, people want to donate to you. They're excited about your story. They're excited about the cause. Um, but invite them along on your journey. Keep them updated once. Um, just because they've donated once, don't let them out of the loop. Like, they want to follow you. 
stay in, involved. Um, and remember that you're giving the, them the opportunity to do something that's amazing. Um, we say around here that the ride will end when HIV and AIDS ends. And so the being part of combating that, of providing the life-saving services that we do is huge. Um, and to be able to interact with your donors and pull them into something bigger than all of us um, is an opportunity. It's very exciting. And then by not asking, you've already made the decision for someone. Um, so just ask, 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 especially if it means going out of your comfort zone. Um, it's for the cause. And um, yes, asking everyone is the way that it, you make it happen and um, don't decide for them. So that is the end of this workshop. If you have any questions, I encourage you to um, populate over here on the side of your screen. There is a questions. You can shoot those over to Aurelia. She'll answer those in real time. Um, if you didn't have the chance to um, or if you think of a question later this evening, um, you'll get a follow-up email from this workshop where you'll be able to reply to that, and we will reach out for your questions there. And then please remember to contact your cyclist representative. Uh, we're here as a, a service to you um, to support you in anything, um, fundraising, training, um, logistics of the ride, the experience, anything. We are here for you, so please never hesitate to give us a call or ask. And thank you so much for joining in this evening. It was lovely to have you all and uh, get out there and fundraise. Bye.